coming to you from Sheboygan, Michigan. That's Sheboygan with a C. I'm RJ Balde, and this is the Trichomes Hash It Out podcast. On this show, we feature conversations about trending cannabis topics. We also bring in industry insiders and influencers to discuss their point of view. In this episode, I'll be talking to Dr. Stephen Dahmer, no relation, about his work at the medical cannabis distributor Virio Health. We'll also talk about his research in ethnomedical systems and much more. Without further ado, it's time to hash it out. Today, I am joined by Dr. Stephen Dahmer, board certified family doctor and chief medical officer at the multi state medical cannabis company, Virio Health. Welcome to the show, Doc. I'm stoked to have you. RJ, such a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed listening to your show and I'm excited to participate. Oh, good. Right on. I'm glad to hear that. Where are you joining us virtually from today? I'm from uh, just a little bit north of uh, the city, New York City, uh, in a little town called Piermont, which I call home. Okay, right on. Now, how has your year been so far? I know that's a loaded question, but I like to start off each conversation with a, a wide question such as that. Yeah, I mean, what a year, right? What a tumultuous, and I guess the term everybody uses is unprecedented, but mm-hmm. what a year. And I think it just, uh, I keep coming back to gratitude. Just keep coming back to that and, and that I'm here on this amazing podcast with you. We're going to talk about some fun things and have my health and uh, and I'm helping others uh, try to maintain or regain theirs. I love that, man. That is, I love to hear that you um, are focusing on on gratitude and practicing gratitude during this time because that's so important, you know, and it's um, a really great tool and resource to use to you know, look for the good out there. You know, uh, there, it's it's a scary time. It's a, like you said, unprecedented, tumultuous time. But if anything, it's um, it's a, even more so a reason to be grateful for those around us that are, you know, keeping us safe on a daily basis. Everyone out there that is essential, man. Shout out to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even a step further that you know, if you have. You know, have your wits about you and and you are blessed with health or even a job to then support those that may not have been as lucky. Um, And that's, you know, something that's one of my oaths as a physician to do. But even now, more than ever, where communities are coming together, where you're supporting the neighbor, where everyone could just use a little bit more, a little bit more of a helping hand. Mm, Absolutely. Do you... um... Do you use like a, any sort of like gratitude practices? Do you like to like write down what you're grateful for? Do you like th- run it through your head maybe before you go to bed or when you wake up or anything like that? Yeah, I do. I like to run it through my head. I like to write things down and I'll be real frank with you. I met uh, years ago in Cuba. I uh, interpreted for Deepak Chopra and I've always been a fan. He wow. even as a, a young med student. He influenced me um, and I still uh, almost on a daily bliss- basis listen to a gratitude meditation that he has a soothing, calming voice for me. You know, I, th- I don't know how, how you feel about kind of guided meditation. Sometimes a voice sure. can make it all or break it all. And I listen to it regularly. And I think it just puts me in that good state of mind. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Um, I remember, uh, I don't know if he's still doing it, but uh, for the past uh, like few years ago, um, he was doing, uh, Deepak Chopra was doing uh, like a 30-day guided meditation series like with Oprah. Yeah. And it was through his app. And yeah, man, I used to love those series. I don't know if he's still doing it now, but yeah, I used to love those 30 day series. Yeah. One other that really impacted me, uh, you probably, probably heard of uh, Brother Steindl Rast and he has a, it's on YouTube, I think it's called A Good Day. And it just is one of those that's, that's just, you know, puts you in that right state of mind. I love that. I love that. And it's certainly, you know, um, it's a constant conscious mental effort right to to always find those places in which you can express a little gratitude or increase your levels of gratitude for something that you know you might deal with or see on a day-to-day basis and you start mark start um you might start to uh you know take it for granted or or you know just think this is the way things are for me and um so it's it's great to have those resources that can put you in that grateful mindset and remind you that there's so much around us to be grateful for, even during a time like this. 
Yeah, no, and I think now more than ever, the you know I think the focus right now, and for good reason, is on physical illness and uh, transmission, and you know sometimes ICUs and vaccines and, and mental health is is really what we all need to be discussing uh, early on uh, because we're already seeing uh, a lot of the ramifications of, of what this is, is triggered for some people and, uh, and and the issues that it's causing in mental health. Certainly, certainly. Now, tell me about. You, oh, I mentioned, you know, before that uh, you are the chief medical officer at, at Vireo Health. Tell me about uh, how long, first of all, how long have you been with Vireo? I'm, I'm coming right up on five years uh, that I've been with Vireo. And I hear different things in cannabis industry that you multiply that by seven or 10 um, to get a real estimate, just uh, how intense the industry can be. And wow, uh, it's been a a crazy ride for the last five years. Sure. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, uh, years in the cannabis industry mature almost like almost as fast as dog years, I want to say, with, you know, how nimble you have to be and how, you know, responsive and, and ready to make drastic changes. Um, y- you know, you need to have those skill sets and you need to have that focus in the cannabis industry just because of how nebulous it still is. You know, the legal cannabis industry has been around for a while, a few years now, but it is still in in many ways in its infancy, don't you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. But also the flip side is the tremendous respect for those that might scoff at five years that have been doing this for 20, 30, 40, <laughs> um, and just realizing how we you know really stand. And I, I say that over and over, kind of standing on the backs of giants of those that paved the way for a physician like me to be discussing cannabis. And totally. I'm excited to talk more about that. Totally, totally. Now, um, yeah, so you've been at, at Vireo for um, about five years now. Tell me about what it was like for you and your team um, back in March when all of the you know Ill- initial lockdown procedures started taking place during the pandemic. What was it like f- over at Vireo? What were you guys thinking? Uh, you know, how did you guys implement plans into uh, where to go from there? Yeah, I think that one of the benefits, I think, uh, you can be have drawbacks of a physician-led company, but uh, I think that was one of the benefits. We jumped very hard and very early um, and, and knew, you know, I've been reading all the literature, uh, looked at, you know, past uh, epidemics that were similar and knew we had to absolutely get in front of this. So instituted across the board, across Vireo, uh, you know, relatively strict protocol from masks to even gloves to hand washing procedures to even shifts within our staff to really ensure that we could continue to serve our patients. And it was that call to action. We need to continue to serve our patients. And we were very fortunate to be deemed essential, which uh, obviously all of us would agree with, but it was mm-hmm. nice to be to have that called out that we were essential and that we were ahead of the game in, in preparing our team to be able to continue that service and, and really protect our, our teammates so that they, they wouldn't fall sick at work. Totally. Now, you are a graduate, from what I understand, of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Is that right? Yeah, and I heard that you're from Michigan. I am. We're, yeah, we're, I was just about to say. We're our day, too, right? So Midwest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're Midwest buddies. Yeah, right. yes, indeed. You know, uh, uh, I remember... <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, there was sort of like a rivalry between Michigan and Wisconsin over who was the mit- like who was the actual mitten state, like mitten shaped state. Um, because, you know, uh, obviously, like Michigan has a has like a claim, a stake on being the mitten state. And Wisconsin was like, I think we're shaped like a mitten. And I just remember that was such a funny. That's like, honestly, the one thing I think about whenever I hear Wisconsin. Is yeah. that like made up rivalry when yeah. I was a kid? That doesn't get me going too much. But what, what really did, I'll be honest with you, RJ, is, is I grew up in a small town called Sheboygan with an S. And Michigan claims yes. to have a Sheboygan with a C as well. And, you know, <laughs> the S side of, of the lake, right? And that's Lake Michigan, you know, kind of looks across the lake and says, let's, let's get your spelling right over there. <laughs> I love that, man. That is so awesome. That is what's up. So you're originally, like you grew up in, in Wisconsin, uh, you didn't just go to school there. You grew up there. Absolutely. Grew up in uh, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and, and went to Madison. Very proud. Uh, fantastic school. I did uh, three out of my four years of undergraduate at, at uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. I did one year in Madrid, Spain. And then I took wow. uh, took a year off and, and was not only working in Dominican Republic, but traveled through South America. 
Um, and I came yeah. back and did, uh, well, two years of med school. And then I did something very unconventional as well. I requested a one year leave of absence after my second year of medical school and not for any reason, but I loved to travel at that point and volunteered in the second largest slum in Brazil called Pirambu on the Northeast mm -hmm. uh, coast of Brazil. And then came up, came back to finish medical school. Wow. Wow. You've really been all over the place. That is so rad. That is, I've never been to Brazil. I, I um, hope to go one of these days, but th that work is so important that you did there. Yeah. Incredible experience. Yeah. It just really shaped me to this day. I love that. Now, how did you go from um, not only attending a school in the Midwest, but growing up in, in the Midwest, you know, where even to this day, apart from I'm Illinois and Michigan are the only two states, I believe, in the Midwest to embrace cannabis legalization. Overall, in the Midwest, it's not really widely embraced even to today. So how did you go from growing up there to then working with medical cannabis? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a, a, a long and windy uh, road. Uh, I guess uh, the short story of it is I always, you know, through my travels, was fascinated with diversity and which mm -hmm. led me to do residency in, in New York. Um, and so did a residency uh, at an underserved clinic uh, with Beth Israel Hospital, um, and and uh, after residency, you know, went to travel a little bit more, um, and then rekindled an old relationship. Uh, the founder of Virio Health, Dr. Kyle Kingsley, he and I had met on a medical exchange to Cuba about 20 years ago, and he called me up while I was working in New York, and he knew that I had an interest in plant medicine, uh, had an interest in integrative medicine, and, and that cannabis was kind of right up my alley and said, listen, you know a lot about plants. What do you know about cannabis? And I admittedly, despite all my studies in plants, knew very little um, and started mm -hmm. to do some research. And he offered me, if we, if we would win uh, one of the very competitive New York licenses to come on as chief medical officer. And that was five years ago, RJ. Wow. Now, why do you think that your um, knowledge up until joining Virio your knowledge on, on medical cannabis was limited. Do you think that that had at all to do with your upbringing in the Midwest? Because I know it did for me. Yeah, I think I think upbringing in the Midwest. But let's just be frank: the the tremendous amount of negative stigma surrounding this this plant is just you know it, we we can't even grasp to what it, to what extent that goes in our psyche. I think for all of us, mm -hmm. and even for me, uh, being a physician that is open to plant medicine, and you know uh, there are thousands of plant medicines. So I had many others to look into and to study and, and to learn more about. But honestly, it was just mm -hmm. truly the, the taboo and stigma surrounding the cannabis plant that uh, kept me from investigating it more. Totally. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, there's just, just, just one more thing on that, RJ. There's just so many layers to it. And even, you know, for me, it probably took me a year to even learn uh, the derogatory history of the term marijuana. Uh, and, yeah. and why we really try to use cannabis. A lot of our laws are written marijuana, so we're forced, even in some states where we operate, to still use the term. But to, you know, to really dig into those things was, was fascinating for me and eye-opening. And then to look at you know, what is that stigma that you bring to the table. And I think I'm up, uh, up to almost 160 lectures I've given on medical cannabis and always started out the same. And even to physicians, like, let's strip away uh, the stigma that we bring to the table and treat this mm. like any other uh, medicine or any other sub mm. substance, if you want to call it that. And let's really look at it from an objective lens and not one that's tainted by that stigma that we bring to the table. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so important, especially in something like the medical field. That's It's so important to approach it um, as objectively as possible, right? Like, right. I, I mean, I'm not in the medical field. I don't want to make assumptions. Now, what what do you think this current state is um, in the broader medical field when it comes to cannabis education? Is there enough of it? Is it better than it was? You know, and where does it need to go? Yeah, there's there's certainly not enough of it. It's certainly better than it was. And we have a very, very long ways to go. But it's just even in a short period of five years, it's been fascinating for me to see the changes. Uh, I, you know, early on, I, I was I was even heckled by physicians to talk about cannabis five years ago at certain wow. lectures, and you know, this is not FDA approved. How can you even talk about this being a medicine? To really, you know, seeing much more acceptance that is accruing. To you know, gave uh, uh, spoke to uh, students that are part of one of the first masters in, in cannabis at the University of Maryland this past week. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're certainly seeing strides. Far more needs to happen. I just, you know, uh, part of what gets me out of bed in the morning is the uh, the incredible 
uh, potential of the endocannabinoid system in impacting uh, disease and, and even health um, and, and how little uh, we are utilizing not only phytomedicines to impact that system, but just even uh, learning more about that system to harness it uh, to improve our health. And, and we're just scratching the surface. Again, standing on, on the backs of some giants that have done some incredible work and in research, but have uh, a long ways to go. And, and every, you know, and, and studies reflect this as well. Physicians are yearning to learn more. Um, mm -hmm. And they might not always outwardly admit it, but even on a lot of the surveys done, uh, they want to know more about what's going on. And it's obvious that patients are utilizing it. So the more that we know, the better we can counsel. And even if that counsel is for harm reduction, um, related to the plant. I, I certainly want to see more counseling related to harnessing the medical potential, but uh, I think uh, the medical community, there are certain subsets that are very hungry to learn more, and I only see that growing with time. So there is positive news there when it comes to um, the wider acceptance of, of cannabis as, as medicine, you know, because there's obviously... Uh, you know, the war on drugs and, and just years and years and years of this, um, uh, the, the pushing of these negative uh, stigmas and stereotypes, you know, that's a, that's a big ship to turn, um, like most things in this country, you know, um, a, a shift in attitude or mentality, it's a big ship to turn, man. It is. No, it, and it has been and will continue to be. But it, I think, it, you know, uh, even physicians, we are moved by uh, family members, by friends, and even more so by patients. And it's something I've observed very keenly over the last five years as a patient or a physician that may be reluctant, right? And, and there are a thousand mm -hmm. reasons for us physicians to be reluctant. There's an mm -hmm. uncertainty related to malpractice. It's not FDA approved. It's very different from other medicines that we're used to. It's not a single biochemical agent. But, you know, what I've seen over and over time and time again, those that join a program and certify their first patient and do see a patient benefit uh, it just very is very moving for them, and it's something that I continue to see over and over that uh, is starting to move the needle. In addition to you know education and and so many um, of of the other um, you know, movements that are are happening with cannabis. Once you see the benefits in a, a person firsthand, um, you know that's that's almost all you need, man. If especially if you compare it to someone who you know, might have been prescribed opiates beforehand. And just right. seeing the difference in, in, you know, how the opiates sort of just mask the, the symptoms or, or the pain, if we're talking specifically. Um, I have, you know, had the opportunity to see that firsthand in people. And that was really what, what pushed my opinion over the edge uh, was when I saw the change in, in people around me. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, we, we don't have too many tools when it comes to chronic pain as physicians, and, I, and we would always benefit from more. And I think that lack of tools is in part what uh, led to the, the crisis that we have seen with opioids. And mm -hmm. I see cannabis as, as a tremendous tool in helping with chronic pain. Um, and there are patients that don't do well, uh, you know, not only death as a side effect or addiction, but some patients that just opioids, opioids don't help or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is a, a, a very high percentage of them that will have constipation as a side effect or other side effects. And, and just to uh, give other tools to uh, treat something as challenging as chronic pain, I, I see tremendous potential for cannabis with that. Certainly, certainly. Love that. Only way to go is up, right? Yeah. Well, and, and again, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll get into it, RJ, and I don't want to jump the gun a little bit, but I, I do, Please. you know, a lot of your podcasts have been about uh, research. And I yeah. really respect that about your podcast Certainly. to date. And you know, again, Gurio, a physician-led company, just really, well, we believe that, you know, science and medicine, uh, we can pull some of that stigma and, and the emotion surrounding this plant out of it. And let's, let's really start to look at some of the data. And so we're very proud uh, to support, you know, high quality research to help truly determine, you know, not only is this helpful in chronic pain, can it help patients get off opioids? Is it safe to take? What kind of side effects do we see? And even more important for me, which is, you know, the other big thing that gets me out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. is to really help someone hone in, you know, and, and right now across the United States, across the world, somebody walks in and I have chronic pain and mm -hmm. they can be overwhelmed by the number of choices. And in most places will say, start low, go slow. And we don't mm -hmm. really have more information for somebody that you know maybe naive and hasn't used cannabis before to really hone in on that appropriate dose, appropriate product, 
uh, appropriate uh, ratio um, to help them alleviate their pain. Yeah, totally. That that actually brings me to my question here. I was going to ask you. Um, so Vireo Health offers an array of, of products from uh, uh, CBD, THC, CBN ratios to THC, CBD ratios, and then also THC or CBD dominant extracts. So can you tell me about the process toward pointing patients uh, to the product that might work best for them uh, for their unique condition? So if I'm a patient and I walk in and I'm trying to find the right product for me, how would you help me um, locate that product? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the million dollar question, right? Aren't yeah. they? And, and I think that, you know, what we've done to date, uh, again, starting out being a physician led company, really looked at the research that existed. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there are, it, it's an amazing plant as well to look at the number of conditions that qualify a person for medical cannabis. And the yeah. latest estimates I've seen are you know, we're over 3.5 million Americans that are part of a state legal program. I've seen estimates over 60 different conditions. So it's very wow. different reasons why people are coming into a dispensary. But we could look at that literature that did exist, you know, to try to at least gauge what might be a right dose specifically of their THC. But then there's mm-hmm. that complexity of the plant. There's the CBD, there's the ratio. You go into the next level of, of minor cannabinoids beyond that, terpenoid levels. And everyone will look at you know some of the literature that exists and, and look at different chemo bars or strains and start to inch someone towards this based on other um, things that they would like to treat in, in addition to their condition or things that they're trying to avoid. Um, but truth be told, this it's just a lot of, uh, of a patient or a customer trying on their own. So a trial and error for them. So one sure. of the, the first things that we tried to do, and, and we have two very, uh, very large on, uh, large scale studies that one is already uh, enacted and the other one is coming up. The first one is an observational trial where we're you know, looking at hundreds of patients with chronic pain, and we can see exactly what it is that they're taking and then that, compare that to the efficacy. And this is the beauty of research, is you start to get data points of you know, third-party tested products, which all the real mm-hmm. products are. We know that they're safe. We know that they're precise within that 10% stated dose of the major cannabinoid. And then we can start to correlate that to how effective it is for someone. And we're going to more and more hone in on to, you know, and, and that's the beauty of this plant is it's nuanced. Every person is incredibly different, but at least to have some guidelines. And so here's kind of a median dose for people with chronic pain. Uh, this is a great chemo bar that works for them for these reasons. And the science backs that this is the direction that you want to go, you know, kind of in this window that we're aiming for, as opposed to, you know, kind of right now, it's just really uh, not much guidance for it at all. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that it's, um, uh, uh, at least for now, it's a lot of, you know, trial and error, just trying to, um, uh, help a patient find, you know, whichever product would work best for them. But I would imagine that, um, when it comes to medical cannabis over different types of medications, a, a trial and error thing is a little less precarious in that medical cannabis, you know, the, potential negative symptoms if you compare it to to opiates or other uh, pharmaceuticals aren't you know as scary am i right in guessing that i absolutely agree and that, you know again one of the big things that turned me on when you could imagine it was a very difficult decision for a physician to get involved in a, in a schedule one substance but mm-hmm, was sure not not exist in ld50 so knowing how many patients can die from pharmaceutical medicines that that doesn't exist with cannabis you know was was some sort of relief for me uh, to explore it more. I do think that there are a lot of patients that either don't get relief or do get side effects. Side effects are very common with cannabis. They're usually Mm -hmm. just, you know, self-limiting, but it's enough, you know, and I think what we've seen in a lot of states is that first wave is, you know, more cannabis savvy, you know, people that were kind of waiting for, you know, the door Mm. to open to walk through. And yet, you know, what I hear from a lot of those that may not be as savvy is, oh, I tried one, you know, capsule or I tried one puff and it didn't do anything. And no one really coached them on, well, you know, you needed to increase or we needed to try to switch you to this. Um, Or the the opposite is, you know, I tried 10 puffs and I almost ended up in the emergency room uh, (laughs) because of that that lack of guidance, unless you've had some experience before and, you know, and are able to really kind of teach yourself on how to go about finding that best dose. Totally, totally. Now, where um, can, uh, you know, someone who um, may not know anything about, 
uh, cannabis. Say I, I, I'm in that group of people who, um, you know, I, I have these symptoms that uh, other medicines aren't working for me, and I keep hearing about medical cannabis, and I want to give it a try, but I don't know much about it, and I'm kind of scared. Where do you think are the best resources for those people to go to, um, whether they be at Vireo, uh, in person or online or anywhere else? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of our website. We touch on all conditions there. There are hints at the research that we're participating in, and that's VireoHealth.com. And, mm-hmm. and just really, you know, what I love, uh, I've always considered myself a patient advocate. And so always encourage patients to be their own advocate as well. And again, mm-hmm. standing on the backs of giants, this, this is a medicine. This is one of the only medicines that I have worked with in my career as a physician that was brought to the table by patients. Uh, you know, really patients advocating for this through politics, patients advocating for this medicine to be available for their child with seizure disorder, um, mm-hmm. you know, fill in the blank that the patients brought this to the table, continue to advocate. There are great Facebook groups. Would really encourage you, you know, reach out to your local dispensary, reach out to Vario, you know, and, and we're accessible, uh, you know, in all the states where we have, op- where we do operate, a uh, phone call away. Oftentimes you can sign up for a newsletter and email away really get hungry about learning more about that because it is a lot of information and it can feel overwhelming at times, but to have a good partner, um, which oftentimes could be a dispensary or, you know, uh, some key players at that dispensary to help learn more um, and, and even recommend some great educational resources and VireoHealth.com is a great place to start. That's so, uh, that's so interesting. I had never thought of uh, that until you brought it up that the many of the things that differentiate cannabis from other uh, uh, medicines is that, like you said, the patients brought it to the physicians and to the doctors and, and advocated for that. Um, I had never thought about that until you brought it up. That's a, that's fascinating to think about. Yeah, no, it's really a, a testament to uh, people that advocate for themselves and, and say, hey, I deserve um, access to this potential medicine. And it's helped uh, someone in my, with a condition like mine, or it's helped uh, a child that has a condition similar to my child, and and I deserve access to that. And it, it's been really amazing to watch that, and and as advocates, really make this more and more available and more accessible. And I think that now that we're starting to see it available, uh, accessibility is is the next big frontier. And that's one of the the things that you know kind of really irks me is that I have interacted directly with patients that have seen mm-hmm. tremendous benefits with cannabis, have decreased their opioid or gone off it completely, had to go back to the opioid because they couldn't afford the cannabis. And the opioid uh, still is, you know, I have a copay that's, uh, that's much cheaper. Or even mm-hmm. patients, I've had very uh, specific examples where my, um, the, the, the pain clinic that I go to does not allow for cannabis, so I have to choose between those two. And again, because cannabis can be a little bit more challenging price, I've had to go back to opioids. Um, and, and those are things that we're also fighting for uh, real health. We did a cost-effective analysis with a NYU researcher uh, mm-hmm. at, at City University of New York to show that you know there is cost-effectiveness in cannabis specific to sickle cell disease. And I think those mm-hmm. are things that will turn the heads, uh, potentially even of insurance companies in the future. Certainly. Now, has, has that study... Um been published yet or is it still in the works? No, that's published. It's online. It's part of a dissertation uh, of Dr. David nice. Younger that looked at that uh, in terms of cost effectiveness. Certainly hope we get to see even more of those. Um, and again, in this kind of fight, I think evidence, research, um, you know, more science are the things that will uh, push the needle on insurance coverage or other things that can make this more accessible to, to other patients. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things that I really love about what you're doing at Vireo is you're focusing on uh, providing that data driven research and that that, you know, the science behind it all that, you know, will really help um, uh, in advocating for the accessibility, like we said, of this medicine for um, for patients that need it. Um, Another thing that would, you know, obviously really help facilitate the accessibility of medical cannabis uh, for patients is legalization. Um, you know, a bunch of states have legalized it. It's still federally illegal, though, uh, in the United States. Um, you know, you're, you're over in New York. What is the vibe like over there? I understand that, you know, legalization was supposed to be on the table. It was, it wasn't. What is going on over in New York? 
Yeah, I think that I, I've given up on that a long time ago. That's where <laughs> I decided, RJ, just to stick to medicine over politics. Uh, <laughs> For my, sure, my, I get you. My uh, political uh, glass uh, ball was, uh, I think I, I lost it in a move a long time ago. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I see bipartisan support. I see it as inevitable. I also see, you know, pressure on economies from COVID and, and this being a potential response to that. And there are arguments for or against. Um, I really see an inevitable movement in that direction. And, you know, even as a physician, uh, even when we talk about an adult use market, um, to have to know that a product is third party tested, to know that it's safe, especially having gone through uh, the vaporizer scare um, and mm. uh, all, uh, a valley instance, uh, you know, instances that to have something third party tested that is trusted, um, that is regulated is a step up from an illicit market. Mm, certainly. I <laughs> I love your analogy about of uh, about politics, man. It's um, it is quicksand. Uh, it's hard to not fall into it, though. So, props will, to you. I will still out. be out there. I will still be out there voting, though. So, I, I certainly have okay. Props, up, yes. Given up on predictions, but I'm certainly going to vote um, for who I think is best uh, suited to uh, to help run the country and, and to sit in office. Props for that. I want to ask you about this also because uh, in 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 researching more about your history and your experience um, and your background, I understand that you are you're a fellow at the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, and I also understand that for over a decade, you, you know, beyond uh, medical cannabis, you have been studying uh, the relationship between plants and and people. And to better understand uh, what is called uh, the the ethno medical system. So, for those who may not know what that is, can you explain what an ethno medical system is and what specifically uh, you're trying to to learn about them? Yeah, I think it's it's you know a much deeper level of the context in which you know medicine is given, and you know mm -hmm. that involves you know if we think of like plant medicine, which across the globe uh, for many people is still their first line of primary care. Many people still go to plant medicine, and that's one of the things that really interested me in early in my travels is how accessible plant medicine is and how affordable it is for many people that grow that in their backyard. Uh, and, and, you know, ethnomedicine kind of studies the relationship between people and that plant uh, and, and how that serves as a medicine. And that includes everything from uh, the growth of, of that plant and the preparation of that, the traditions surrounding that. Um, and how that's evolved over time, uh, that relationship between those people and that plant and its use as a medicine. Mm. And your your work in that has um, taken you all over the world. You mentioned a little bit earlier in the show um, some of where it's taken you, um, such as, you know, uh, um, to the second largest slum in Brazil uh, that you mentioned. Um, I understand also that you worked... Uh, in Maori clinics in New Zealand, is that right? That's true. Yeah, in, in uh, Fang Fanganui or Wanganui, uh, I worked uh, as a primary care physician, so worked both at a, a clinic um, within uh, you know kind of uh, native culture, the native uh, Maori population, uh, mm -hmm. and also in urgent care as well. Uh, and Wanganui is kind of the southern coast of the Northern Island, and really you know eighty five percent Maori. And so every, you know, every, almost every patient that I saw, Maori in origin, and, you know, again, in all of those uh, travels and, and uh, Wanganui and New Zealand included, I mean, it just was so fortunate. And, and oftentimes come there and you think you're the doctor from the United States that's, you know, sharing medicine or knowledge. And I honestly learned so much from every culture that I ever interacted with and touched, including the Maori, that on site at the clinic where I worked had uh, traditional healers uh, that would uh, teach me uh, kind of general knowledge about medicinal plants that they used. Uh, and I would supplement that with my Western medical knowledge. Uh, sometimes in working in urgent care, we saw pretty extreme things from, you know, even uh, melanoma skin cancer to uh, broken bones to uh, one night in urgent care, I had a, a patient with uh, 42 lacerations. Uh, it took a oh. long time uh, to, to uh to put together those lacerations, but learned so much from the Maori culture and, and from all over the world, uh, from the uh, favela in, in Brazil, Dominican Republic, Cuban traditional healers, Palawan Islands uh, have done work there as well. It's just uh, so eye-opening. Man, that's so awesome. And I understand um, even here in the States, in, in Arizona, you worked with the Navajo tribe. 
Yeah, how, how could I neglect to mention? Yeah, the yeah. I worked in uh, Chinle, Arizona. If you've ever been out, have you ever been out to Arizona, RJ? I've been out to Arizona, not Chinle though. Yeah, so the uh, Canyon de Chez was my backyard, I like to say, and I worked as a hospitalist there, and we had a four-bed ICU and, and uh, took care. I remember one uh, uh, one week on the wards, so I was a hospitalist working in the hospital. I had two code talkers um, in, in beds adjacent to one another, Whoa. which honest, honestly, before my, uh, you know, I'm really ashamed to say, before uh, even working there, I didn't know what a code talker was. Have you heard of mm-hmm. code talkers? I have just recently too, actually. So yeah, yeah. So it was like the uncracked code that you know Navajo mm-hmm. was such a challenging uh, uh, language that none of our enemies uh, in the world war were able to crack that code. And mm-hmm. uh, and again, in Chin Lee, even on the hospital, they had uh, a, a native healing, uh, what's called a ogan on site, where uh, native healers were present and available for those that you know wanted traditional healing as well. Wow, that's so fascinating. And how long were you working there for? That was a shorter uh, uh, a shorter job. That was nine months. I worked there as locum tenens uh, in Chile, Arizona. Wow, that is fascinating, man. Uh, you know, how awesome is it that you, um, y- you know, your work has taken you all around the world, man, and you're able to bring this healing for, for people who really need it, man. That must be so fulfilling. Yeah, and it's really just a tremendous, uh, I feel so fortunate. And again, coming back to gratitude, everyone mm. that I interacted with and, and just was always amazed at, at, at any, so many of these cultures that I, I went to. And, and if you ever see me, I'm, I'm six foot four and very white and freckled. Um, but just, you know, the oftentimes the open arms and, and yeah. you know, there, there's always everyone is always a little bit uh, has their eye out for the foreigner that comes through. But just so many uh, cultures that uh, I worked in uh, and I think it's uh, somewhat you know opening to be a doctor in a culture uh, that there is mm-hmm. even maybe a little bit more opening. But just we're so grateful and, and so gracious with lessons to me. I remember uh, a quick story in, in New Zealand when I finished on my last day. Um, the, uh, the tribe brought together a circle, um, and had a closing ceremony, uh, with music where each person in the circle sang something to me about how I had touched them and gave me a wow. whale, a hand carved whalebone uh, necklace as a departing gift. And just, you know, I, I can picture it even as I'm telling the story. Um, and, and again, for a short period of time or what I'd consider a short period of time, just such a, a gracious culture, um, to share so much with me. Whoa, dude. That is awesome. You you do all this work with um, uh, trying to better understand ethnomedical systems and the relationship between plant medicine and people. Do you think at all this sh- sends um, a shiver down the spines of those in the pharmaceutical industry who, um, you know, might see people embracing alternative medicines as a threat to their bottom line? I, I, I don't see it as such. I'm, I'm just, you know, the more you get to know me, RG, I'm, I, and I think I have to be is, is kind of a, a rosy colored glasses, glass half full type of person. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think the pharmaceutical industry has really served us well in many regards, right? There are some amazing medicines out there that I've used, you know, for, for decades as a physician. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, again, there are always exceptions to the rule, but I, you know, I, I do think that the best interest is, is really to bring products to market that serve people. Um, I do think we've lost our ways, and, and that's one of the things that all my travels have taught me is, you know, uh, the respect that we should have for a medicine. To really mm-hmm. start low, go slow with every medicine, to use them the minimal amount uh, necessary, um, and, and to really have that respect. I think we've become very lax with pharmaceuticals, um, and that's one of the things I talk about quite a bit is polypharmacy, and especially even in our elder population the number of us as we get over 65 that are on five, uh, seven, even 10 medications is very daunting and scary because there's oftentimes a cumulative side effect profile and these can cause harm. And I think that again, like so many things, we're looking for other ways to potentially improve health. And in my lectures, I talk a lot about botanical medicines. And for Mm -hmm. a long time, they've been considered dirty, um, you know, multiple components, hard to study, Hard to uh, make a precision product. How to hard to get through an FDA process? You know, there's only been two botanical drugs that have gone through that process in the history of the FDA. But I have this hope, and I think we're on the precipice of some of some changes. Where especially in chronic medicine, we'll see the benefit 
of these subtler uh, plant chemicals used in combination that don't have such intense side effects as we talked about. And, and I think we'll see more use of those, hopefully even in mainstream medicine, which is one of the things I'm really working towards. Nice. Right on. I dig that. So that brings us to this now. What uh, What's next for you personally? And then what is next? What's on slate over at Virio Health? What have you got in the works over there? Oh, we always we have so many things on the works at, at Virio Health. Um, I couldn't possibly cover them all from new product <laughs> development to new delivery forms. We have an amazing R&D team uh, just came out with a uh, uh, can of safe. It's kind of a new uh, container oh, yeah. for uh, flower and bud that is going to retain or protect that terpenoid profile, mm -hmm. which is a big thing for me as an aficionado of plants. You want to try to maintain that plant in its original state as much as possible. And this terp safe uh, can do that uh, and actually published a study to that. One of the big things we are excited about, and really a credit goes to Dr. Chinasso Cunningham at Montefiore and her team. Uh, have put together, uh, and it's on clinicaltrials.gov, it's under uh, RELIEF, R-E-L-E-A-F, we have mm -hmm. a randomized control trial coming up where we will be randomizing patients to a voucher for uh, either one of our three uh, top products that we use for pain, one that has a higher THC content, one that has a one-to-one -one THC CBD, one that has a higher CBD content versus placebo. So the type of study that's been incredibly challenging to do here in the United States and really virtually impossible if you're not using uh, bud and flower or a product from Ole Miss, uh, we're looking to uh, initiate uh, kind of the uh, recruitment for patients for the study coming up here in October, which is very exciting. And again, giving honing in on that information of patients with chronic pain, which of those products will help most? I mean, there's still even a debate. Is CBD uh, a CBD dominant product? Does that work in pain? Um, you know, uh -huh. what is that? What is that right ratio for a patient to help them with it? Um, so you can check the Virio website. Um, it's also again on clinicaltrials.gov, and it'll be an ongoing trial. So these things don't happen quickly. Um, it'll be ongoing probably a good three years, if not even a little bit more. It takes uh -huh. time to get these these great answers. Uh, uh -huh. But again, Virio, on top of making amazing products, constantly pushing the envelope on new delivery forms. Uh, pushing the envelope on uh, research and development. We're planting seeds early um, on these difficult questions that we can better advise all of our, our customers and patients in the future. I love that. And and you're accepting, are you accepting applications from just New York area or is this a nationwide thing? This will be uh, New York based uh, okay. to begin with. Um, and again, the, the, once we do launch a recruitment, which will be in early October, uh, mm -hmm. there'll be information on clinicaltrials.gov on our website. Um, you know, you can call our dispensaries and, and certainly uh, recruitment is going to be a big thing and yeah. getting, uh, getting patients that are interested in supporting research and participating in this um, it really hasn't been a huge challenge. For the most part, you know, people that do utilize uh, medical cannabis or, 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 you know, move to that direction are interested in getting more answers. And I just hear it over and over. We need more research. We need more research. We need more research. We're not sitting on the sidelines. Even with the many hurdles that exist to do that, Virio mm -hmm. is paving a path to get better answers for our, for our customers and our patients. I love that. And I, and I love the pursuit that uh, the team over at Virio is is undertaking to bring this information and to to conduct this this vital research um, in order to uh, help patients better understand uh, cannabis as a medicine and and how it can help them specifically for certain ailments that they might be experiencing or certain symptoms that they might be experiencing. That is so so rad, man. Now, yeah, um, yeah please. Well, I was just going to say, and then the fun part about that is the, you know, the side effects to doing something that is challenging like that, not only to get better uh, answers, right, for the 3.5 million Americans, not to mention worldwide, that are using this plant, but also, you know, potential ramifications with industry or with the medical community or, you know, other circles that there has been this stigma to say, yeah, this is, this has potential uh, role in, in, as a therapeutic agent for uh, fill in the blank. Love it. Love it. That is rad, dude. Oh man. I'm, I'm inspired to hear that, man. I hope it all goes well. Um, I hope the application process runs smoothly and I hope that y'all are able to, uh, to collect some important data before we go here. First, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak to me today and to, you know, 
uh, bring me up to date with everything that y'all are doing at Virio. Uh, before we go, where can our listeners um, find out again what you are up to personally, what Virio is up to, um, and then also uh, uh, where they can sign up uh, through the government website for the clinical trial? Yeah, so the uh, I have you know I'm active on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and you can you can Google me for all of those. Um, I'll give a shout out. Uh, Americans for Safe Access just started LeafWire. I don't know if you heard about this, but it's supposed to be a LinkedIn for cannabis. It's I called just, LeafWire. LeafWire, yeah, LeafWire. Ah, okay. I just joined that uh, on a whim. I got it in my inbox, so it's brand new. Uh, I, I am <laughs> a fan of, uh, of Americans for Safe Access and the amazing work that they do do. Um, and then absolutely, please come to our website, muriohealth.com. And before we wrap it up, RJ, I do want to give uh, a, a huge shout out um, to, and you had her on the show as well, Dr. Paloma. Dr. Yes, Paloma, indeed. Yeah, we're, we're so proud that, again, we're medical and science-based and RCT and, you know, getting these answers for patients and pushing delivery forms. She mm-hmm. also uh, heads up, along with uh, Amber Shimpa, our, our uh, diversity and equity initiative. And just this past week, held an awesome event at Marianne and Maine in Maryland uh, and, and supported, you know, ex- expungement for uh, 45 individuals. And I just wow. think that, you know, again, we have such a duty um, uh, to support those that have been wronged uh, by the stigma surrounding cannabis um, and was very proud of our team to participate in that and, and to potentially, right, uh, support those that have been negatively impacted by this um, and we all know, uh, you know, what a negative impact that can have on, on a family, on an individual, uh, on unemployment, uh, which absolutely impacts health. Certainly, definitely. Um, I'm going to look you up on LeafWire right now. I just opened up a tab, so <laughs> I'm going to look you up. <laughs> I'll meet you there. RJ, uh, absolutely. Right on. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I'm excited about the, the Tricomes uh, website and, and just a, a real pleasure to be on your show. Absolutely, man. Pleasure to have you. Hopefully, uh, maybe we can meet up uh, across the lake one time in Michigan and Wisconsin and have a have a episode two. As Socially distant. Not, as long as you're not in Sheboygan with a C. <laughs> right on. We'll meet up in on your on your side of the lake this time. How about that? How you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> My thanks again to Dr. Stephen Dahmer for joining me. If you are a member of the cannabis community and have a story you want to share with us, we would love to hear from you. You can reach the show at hash it out at trichomes.com. You can help others find the show by taking a moment to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. You can also join the discussion with industry insiders and get your voice heard by joining the community at trichomes.com and following us on all social media. Hash It Out is produced by David Fortin and presented by trichomes.com. I'm RJ Balde. Thanks for listening, y'all.